why don't we uh, go ahead and get started today. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, we've got two talks today. One is uh, myself talking about the role of cardiac MRI for LV function assessment, how it's done. And then Dr. Chang is going to talk about uh, CT and nuclear uh, for use of uh, LV function. So the first question, I think, is uh, why use CMR? So a couple of things I think to keep in mind is that uh, CMR is very nice in that it's um, able to provide you with fairly accurate uh, assessment of chamber size, global function, regional LV function, uh, in a variety of different uh, types of heart disease. And although echo is going to be the most widely used modality for assessment of LV function because of its low cost, portability, and widespread availability, there are some limitations with echocardiography, specifically uh, suboptimal uh, acoustic windows, operator dependence, and then I think importantly, most echo techniques uh, require the use of some geometric assumptions to be made. Uh, whereas with CMR, you're able to achieve uh, fairly high spatial and temporal resolution, very good signal to noise, with really a free choice of imaging plane, so you can be sure that you've got an ideal imaging uh, plane. And then lastly, uh, with, without requiring the need for geometric assumptions. And I'll talk to you about what I mean by that in a second here. So this will be typically what we would do if we wanted to uh, do an LV function study. Um, we would basically, first off, uh, based on a two-chamber and a four-chamber view, identify a short axis plane that is perpendicular off of both of these views so we can ensure that we're truly perpendicular to the axis of the left ventricle. And then we would obtain a series of short axis images, uh, typically from the base of the heart, uh, you know, at the level of the mitral annulus or higher, all the way down to the very apex of the heart. Uh, and these slices are typically every 10 millimeters apart from each other, so one centimeter sl contiguous slices. And um, let me kind of go through and talk about how we actually obtain these images. Now, with CMR, it's an important thing to keep in mind is this thing called segmentation. Does anybody know what that is? Okay, nobody? Okay, so that, this is where it's different than with, with echo. Most CMR images are acquired in what we call a segmented fashion, which means that you acquire part of the image in one cardiac cycle and part of the image in a second cardiac cycle and part in a third, and you typically do that over four to six cardiac cycles to then generate a high resolution image. And so the, the issue of segmentation is, I'll show you if I'm doing a still frame image here, where the, the other unique aspect of CMR is we're not obtaining just a part of the image, rather we're obtaining certain lines of data which then undergo a Fourier transformation to actually generate the image, but all lines of data somehow contribute to the image formation. So, for example, after the first cardiac cycle, if I obtain just a few lines of data, I can actually reconstruct an entire image. But notice the resolution of the image is suboptimal. Now, if I obtain more lines of data with a second heartbeat, and I reconstruct that image, now I get uh, higher spatial resolution, smaller pixel sizes. And as I do this over and over again, I continuously get smaller and smaller pixel sizes until I get higher and higher spatial resolution. So uh, it's not that you're obtaining a, you know, the top half of the image and the bottom half of the image. Rather, each line of data somehow contributes to the image. And this is important because then if you have an error somewhere where things are not exactly the same between one cardiac cycle and the next, then the error that you get is not this, the traditional stitch artifact that you're used to seeing with CT or with 3D echo, but it'll be a slightly different artifact, and we'll, we'll go through and show you how that works. Now, obviously, what I showed you here is if we're just obtaining a single still frame image, but if you want to obtain L, assess LV function or contractility, you want to obtain more than just a single image. You actually want to obtain a series of image throughout the entire cardiac cycle, so you want to obtain a movie. And, and so what a cine loop is essentially is a series of 20 to 25 frames that are each obtained at slightly different phases of the cardiac cycle that when you play them one after another, then you appreciate motion. And that's what this is here. And it's the same thing as what you see when you see a movie loop on echo. 
Uh, the difference, obviously, is that this movie loop right here is taken over not one cardiac cycle, but it's actually taken over several cycles and then reconstructed into one high resolution cycle worth of data. Now, so the way that we would do this is in, in a similar fashion to the way we would obtain a still frame, but the difference is as I obtain my lines of data, I would take the first, let's say, 40 milliseconds of, of lines of data and put those into my movie frame one. The next 40 milliseconds would go into movie frame two, and then I would keep doing that all the way through the entire duration of this cardiac cycle. And then for the second cardiac cycle, I would go back and add additional lines of data for frame one, and then frame two, and all the way through my 20 or 30 frames, and then keep doing this over and over again until I've generated all the lines of data that I, that I need to reconstruct a high res image. So here's now an example of a cine loop right here. Now one of the things though is we need to recognize when something is done incorrectly. So if I show you this here, what do you guys think? You say, hey, it looks good, or there's something wrong with it. So describe what you see. And if you want to come closer to the front, you're more than welcome to do that. This is not a very interactive group today, is it? OK, shall we start calling on people? Yeah. All right, Dr. Jessen, you came in last, so we'll call, you, call on you first. It looks OK, or something's wrong? OK, and I'm not even talking about, don't, don't worry about diagnosing, uh, making an uh, you know, uh, uh, interpretation. It's just talking about image quality. OK, so, so if you look at it, I mean, what, what, ideally what you want to see when you have a loop is you want to see systole, you want to see diastole where the heart relaxes, and you want to be able to see the borders as it goes, and then once you're done with all of diastole, then you want the loop to play again, right? In this case, if you look at systole, whoops, I stopped it. The contraction looks fine, right? But then notice what happens. Boom, it looks like it starts all over again, right? So the issue here is that this is a case where we, we purposefully did something incorrectly, which is that we didn't capture the entire cardiac cycle. So we're missing some of the diastolic frames, okay? And that's why the movie looks like it jerks. It looks like it plays normally, and all of a sudden it starts back all over again at the very beginning, all right? And again, part of this is recognizing when things are not done right um, so that you know how to troubleshoot. This is a case where whoever set, you know, when we were doing the acquisition, we purposefully set the acquisition window to be shorter than what the patient's RR interval actually is. So if his RR interval was actually eight, every 800 milliseconds, we purposefully set this for 600 milliseconds so that we lose part of diastole. Now here's one, and what do you think about this here? Now we're going to call on somebody else, and uh, I know there's some new fellows in the room. Uh, why don't we call on Dr. Wang? So what do you think about this movie loop here? Okay, so and so looks like you see one normal contraction, right? And then normal relaxation, and then it looks like there's another little blip and then it starts over again, right? So the problem here is that we purposefully set the acquisition window too long so that it captures all of one cardiac cycle, but then actually started capturing parts of an additional cardiac cycle as well, right? But notice it doesn't capture the whole next cycle because I told it instead of acquiring for 700 milliseconds, which is this person's RR interval, we told it to acquire for 900 milliseconds, let's say. So you got a couple of extra frames that are in your loop, right? And again, that's not an aesthetically pleasing image because you get that little uh, double blip at the end, which you don't want to have either. Okay, let's go to another case now. What about this one here? And who, who do we want to call on here? Uh, I guess we could call on Dr. Champsey. We'll, we'll go with the advanced fellows for now. Okay. 
OK, no, this is not real time. This is segmented. Was that? Was that? You think we haven't kept, because we've got several frames in diastole as well, right? I mean, the, the thing actually, if you look at it, look at systole. Look at the borders during systole. How do they look? Right. Blurry. Blurry, right? And so what's the reason for that is because the, there's not enough images, right? So the temporal resolution is not optimal, OK? So ideally, you want to have a frame rate of 20 to 30 frames per second, right? That means a temporal resolution of about 30 to 50 milliseconds. In this case, what happened is each of these frames is 80 milliseconds. So that's why you notice the images in diastole don't look that bad. Like the end, you know, the, let me see if I can pause this here. Like the images in diastole look, borders look crisp in diastole, right? But let me show you systole, right? During systole is when the borders look a little bit fuzzy, all right? So again, this is when you've got suboptimal temporal resolution. So instead of getting this a frame every 40 milliseconds, oh, I'm sorry, context. wrong one. <coughs> instead of getting a frame every 40, yeah, so maybe was I showing you the wrong? Right, you can see the borders here look blurry versus the borders in diastole look fairly crisp. Because in diastole, the, the suboptimal temporal resolution is not as much of an issue. And this is a problem here is that each frame is taken over 80 milliseconds, not 40 milliseconds like we normally want to target. And again, so you have to make sure that you get the optimal parameters for each patient. Now, what about this one here? Uh, who should we call on here? Uh, Dr. Khan? Right. So. So there's nothing wrong with the image here. It, in fact, this, because look, if you look at systole, you can see the systolic frames very nicely. You can see the diastolic frames nicely. And you've got the entire cardiac cycle as well, and then starts with the next cycle. In fact, here, it's just it's very high temporal resolution. The challenge, though, is that when you have very high temporal resolution, the breath hold time gets very long, right? So you know, that image on the right-hand side was one of our techs who could hold their breath for 30 seconds, so it was not a problem. But for a heart failure patient coming in, 30 seconds may not be, be uh, an optimal time. And so on the right-hand side, you've got temporal resolution of about 10 milliseconds a frame. So a frame rate of about 100 frames a second. So um, again, recognizing when there's an issue will help you in being able to troubleshoot. Now, uh, what are the most common problems that we have? Obviously, most commonly, it's, it's when they're, one is obviously if, if the tech makes a mistake, or we make a mistake in how we set the parameters. The other, though, is if we have a patient who's having irregularity, right? And so what's the irregularity that can occur? You can have, uh, you know, basically atrial fibrillation. You can have ventricular ectopy. And the way that I like to think about this when you troubleshoot this is to really classify it into, is it a regularly irregular rhythm or is it an irregularly irregular rhythm? And the way that you would you target your acquisition then would really be dependent on that. So ventricular bigeminy, that's what we've got here. Is this a regularly irregular rhythm or irregularly irregular rhythm? OK, so it's regularly irregular, right? So there's actually some pattern to the irregularity. So you could actually, knowing that, you could actually come up with a way to work around that. And here's what you can do. You could actually say, you know what? Um, there's two strategies you could do. You could say, uh, if you look on the right-hand side, say, well, let's tell the scanner that this R interval is not 600 milliseconds, but actually double. So you capture both the normal QRS and the PVC beat all in one block. And that's what I'm showing you on the right-hand side here. right? So you can see the actual abnormal contraction. You can see the PVC, but you've also got the normal QRS beat as well. So this is one way you can get around it. If it's, if it's a regular irregular rhythm, you can just simply do this, and you still now have a, an accurate movie loop, uh, which in fact is representative of what's actually happening to this patient. And you can see the image quality looks quite good. OK, now what do you do about if you have AFib with a lot of RR variability, or you have PVCs that just fall every so often, right? So those are what you call you know, irregularly irregular uh, rhythms. 
And obviously, if you just do the standard acquisition, you're going to get some poor image quality. Right? So that's where we have a technique that's called arrhythmia rejection, where you basically tell the scanner, OK, most R intervals are falling within a certain window, let's say 800 milliseconds plus or minus 100. If it goes outside of that window, then discard that beat. And so that's a way to basically toss out the beats that are suboptimal. So you can see in this patient who's having PVCs, if I do the regular acquisition, looks blurry. If I now do it with an arrhythmia rejection technique, notice now everything looks good because those irregular PVC beats, I just tossed them out. So I didn't incorporate those into uh, uh, my movie loop. And so the downside with that obviously is every time I toss a beat, I have to replace that with another beat so the breath hold gets longer and longer and longer, right? The more irregular beats you have. And so sometimes if somebody has a lot of irregularity, then that can actually lead to so many discarded beats that the breath hold time becomes very long. So sometimes it's not feasible. <clears throat> um, there's other strategies and tricks we can do, but I'm going to, for the purposes of this lecture, we're going to skip past some of those other ones. Um, and then let me move on to something else, which is recognizing. Remember we said there's two orders of motion that we have to deal with when we're imaging the heart that you don't have to deal with if you're imaging the brain or the, the knees, which is breathing motion and cardiac motion. So when we have an issue, we want to be able to identify, is this a problem with breathing motion or is this a problem with arrhythmia or gating motion? So I'm going to show you two uh, images. Oh. And I gave you the answer as well. So if you look on the left-hand side, this is a problem with breathing. The right-hand side, it's a problem with arrhythmia. How did I determine that? Can you, by looking at the images, tell me what it is that's telling me that one is an arrhythmia problem and the other is a breathing problem? OK, who else do we have? Who are the other fellows here? The general cardiology fellows? There's one back there. I don't, I don't think I've met him yet, but he's not admitting to being a fellow. But I think you're a fellow, <laughs> right? Or do, you, or, do you, or do you want to get a new position? Uh, Yes, and that, you're absolutely right, which is if it's a respiratory issue, it's going to affect structures outside of the heart as well. So if you look at the abdomen, you'll see that there's some blurriness in the abdominal structures as well, whereas if it's purely a, a arrhythmia or a gating issue, then only the heart is going to look abnormal. The abdominal structures and the chest wall will look n nice and sharp borders. Okay, so let's try, hopefully, this case. So here's another example now, without giving away the answer, can you guys tell me which is which? OK, so A is breathing and B is gating. Is that right? Everyone agree with that? Uh, man, if you're here, do you want to disagree with Wahaj? No, Wahaj is not here. OK. So you're absolutely right. Look at the abdomen, right? Looks blurry. That tells you this is a, a respiratory issue. Here, the abdomen looks nice and crisp. But it's just the heart that looks blurry. So this, again, is a, is a arrhythmia problem. <coughs> OK. So and then last resort, if you try everything and you still can't figure out how to solve it, uh, you can always go to a technique called real-time imaging, where, in essence, you're painting the images in real time. Uh, there's no segmentation, no gating necessarily required. The downside with that, obviously, is that the image quality is not as high. So you're compromising a little bit on your spatial and temporal resolution. And then we're doing some additional tricks by using parallel imaging. Um, but this is what you get on the left-hand side here. So this is the standard image with a uh, five to eight second breath hold. It looks like this. This is an image right here on the left-hand side, which is obtained in real time. So no breath holding required. Uh, if you can't even get EKG gating, it's not a problem. The patient's having arrhythmia, it's not a problem because you're obtaining this image in real time. Um, and you can see. Like if you look at the papillary muscle heads or you look at the trabeculations within the RV, on the right-hand side image, which is higher resolution, you can see those better than the left-hand side image where it looks a little bit blurry. But again, if you're simply trying to assess LV function, I think the left-hand image here is quite good. Um, and so what I say to the text, though, is that you should never give me an image that looks worse than this. Because if you're trying to get the high-res breath-held image and it's not working for some reason or another, Always make sure you go back to the real-time image, because this you can always get on every single patient. 
Okay, so now let's, let's kind of turn beyond how we're doing the image acquisition to talk a little bit about uh, assessment uh, and interpretation. So first off, uh, a typical LV function study by CMR would only take about 10 to 15 minutes to acquire. Uh, doesn't need any IV or contrast. Um, and uh, you, you can typically get a set of images from the base of the heart all the way to the apex of the heart. And then we'll also do the standard long axis views, the two chamber, the four chamber, and the three chamber views. In addition to that, we can also do specific views of the right ventricle as well to interrogate the RV also. And the way that we then compute our ejection fraction and our volumes is by using the true Simpson's rule of disk, which means that since we've got sequential slices here from base to apex, the top here is diastolic frame and the bottom here is end systolic frame. We would go through and, and planimeter the contours in each of these individual frames of diastole. And if you add up the volume, and the volume really is just the area times the thickness. The area, obviously, we measure by, by drawing the ROI. The thickness here, since these are all one centimeter apart, the thickness here is 10 millimeters or one centimeter. If you add up these volumes together, that gives you a total end diastolic volume. If you do the same thing in systole, you now have a total LV and systolic volume. Well, that, the thickness here is just how far apart each slice is, right? So in this case, each slice is a centimeter apart, so that will be what you use as a thickness, right? Uh, because a volume is not a two-dimensional, volume is a three-dimensional measure. And, and, and volume in this case for each slice is the area, which is centimeter square, times the thickness of the slice, which is one centimeter, which gives you centimeter cubed, which is milliliters. Okay, and then if you go back, there's uh, numerous studies in the literature, both in the setting of in vivo and ex vivo, and in fact also uh, where they took casts of cadaveric hearts and compared the volume that you got by CMR to the true volume that you got of these casts, and you can see there's a fairly tight relationship between CMR-derived volumes and, and true volumes using a variety of different gold standards. So, and again, the advantage with this is there's no geometric assumptions that are being made here. Um, now, let me show you how you, we would actually go through and do this. So I think I've got, yep. um, you know, this is actually how our workstation looks. We would basically go through and line up each individual slice. Now, notice on CMR, I know exactly where each slice is because the scanner defines it a slice offset. So this right here is slice offset negative 59, which means you can think of it as negative 60. This is negative 70, negative 80, negative 90. So I know these are all 10 millimeters apart from each other. So these are all the same imaging plane, all 10 millimeters apart from each other. And I would line up every single frame that I have, uh, every single slice location, and then basically just start going through and, and drawing the contours on each individual one. Um, and as I do that, I want to make sure that I, I determine where the base of the heart is and where the apex of the heart is by cross-referencing it to a long axis view. And not just a single long axis, but in fact, a series of long axis. So if, to the four chamber, three chamber, and two chamber view. So I know where do I start tracing the base of the heart. Sometimes what will happen is, let's say, the, the slice is actually in the middle. So that one slice is above and one slice is below. In, in those cases, you may want to trace half of a slice. So we have the ability to do all of that uh, because we, can, we have a 3D anatomic coordinate system uh, in the scanner, and then um, another important thing that, is, that we want to keep in mind is that if you look, <clears throat> the base of the heart actually shifts between diastole and systole, right? That's that mitroannular descent that normally occurs. And so as a result, generally if you're going to trace a particular slice in diastole as being a part of the ventricle, that basal slice may no longer be part of the ventricle during systole. So you want to make sure you account for that when you do your tracings and you do your measurements. Otherwise, it can lead to an error in stroke volume and EF assessment. Um, now, the amount of, of descent that occurs is variable from patient to patient. Um, and it can be anywhere from zero to two slices, meaning zero to two, to zero to two centimeters of descent that can occur. And the only way to know that is by looking at it for each individual patient and de determining how much descent to, to account for or allocate. Um, the other important thing is to have a convention in your laboratory as to whether or not you include the papillary muscles as part of the LV volume or as part of the uh, muscle. 
Um, and, and the SEMR, the society says you can go either way, but you just need to make sure that you're consistent about it as you do it each time. And the reason for it is because the papillary muscles may in fact represent anywhere from 6 to 10 percent of the total uh, LV mass uh, and also of the total volume. And so if you're inconsistent with that from one study to another, you could get a, a 6 to 10 percent variability in your measurements just simply because you trace it differently. Okay, um, let me skip past this here. And let's talk about now normal values. So another important thing to keep in mind is that normal values for left ventricular volumes are going to be different by CMR than they are by echo. So if you look at the echo guidelines, this is Lang et al. from 20, 2015, uh, says the LV or uh, end diastolic volume by echo, the normal reference range is 35 to 75. Whereas you can see by CMR, the normal reference range uh, for index values, end diastolic volume divided by BSA, is really anywhere from 57 to 105. So you have quite a bit larger ventricles or ventricular volumes by CMR than you do by echo. The other important thing to keep in mind is that there's a quite a bit of difference between men and women as well, right? If you look at this pool data here, and again, this is patients between the ages of 20 and 80, the upper limits of normal for men is 105. For women, on the other hand, it was 96. So you've got almost a, a 10 cc difference uh, in index and diastolic volume uh, between men and women for the upper limits of normal. Um, the other thing also is the ejection fraction. If you look at age, you notice that the lower limits of normal for EF, actually for young people, may be as low as 57. All right? But then as you get older, and these are again all normal volunteers that were studied, uh, the lower limits of normal gets higher. For patients over the age of 70, lower limits of normal is in fact 60%. And then for end diastolic volume, you'll notice that for young patients, the upper limits of normal for LV and diastolic volume may be as high as 101. And again, this is pool data for both uh, men and women, whereas for older patients, the upper limit of normal is quite a bit lower, 88. So I think the take home message is that in younger patients, the ventricles tend to seem a little bit bigger and the EF tends to seem a little bit lower, but you need to make sure that you index it or you count for, you compare it to a table of normals for a patient's given size and age and gender uh, before you call it uh, being abnormal. Um, and then this is just some data showing actually the reproducibility of measurements by CMR. So this is the inter-observer or inter-study reproducibility uh, between for end diastolic volume and systolic volume, EF and mass, between echo and then CMR, both in normal volunteers as well as in blue CMR patients with heart failure. And you can see that you have much lower interstudy variability in these measures of volumes, EF, as well as mass. And so as a result, when you're looking for serial changes, uh, CMR may be an ideal technique. Uh, and also, especially if you're uh, doing a study where you're trying to look at uh, identify changes with different therapies, uh, you can power your study with a much, much smaller sample size with CMR than you can with echocardiography. And that's why, what, as, as you see now, with newer pharmaceutical compounds that are coming out, where they're trying to track uh, volumes of the heart or mass of the ventricle, uh, many of these studies now are switching to using CMR uh, as part of the, the uh, uh, study. Um, the other thing also to keep in mind is that uh, values by CMR differ compared to values that you get by echocardiography. Um, and this is one study where they looked at a series of patients. Uh, a third had normal EF, a third had mild LV dysfunction, and a third had severe LV dysfunction. And within this cohort of patients, if you look at the LV ejection fraction for this group of patients, you can see that with, uh, by CMR and by cath, the EF here was 55, you know, about 55% for this cohort, whereas by unenhanced echo, the EF was a bit lower at 50%, uh, compared to if you gave contrast to the echo, uh, the EF got closer to the EF that you got by CMR and by, uh, by cath. And the reason for that actually seemed to be that it's probably due to end diastolic volume differences. Uh, and you'll notice that with unenhanced echo, you get much lower LV end diastolic volumes than you got by CMR and by CAF. Now, what's the reason for that? This actually was a very nice study that was done uh, by a group out in Chicago, published almost 10 years ago, where they were looking actually at the uh, com comparability of CMR with 3D echo assessment of volumes, 
And what they noticed is that there was a uh, underestimation of volumes by 3D Echo, uh, but that if they retraced the CMR where they didn't push the contours all the way out, and, and one of the challenges that you have in Echo is that lateral resolution makes it difficult oftentimes to be able to see into all of these uh, recesses over here. And by simply undertracing the CMR, they're actually able to demonstrate a much tighter correlation uh, between the echo and the, and the uh, between 3D echo and CMR. And their conclusion was that it was really this uh, uh, underestimation on the, the echo is, is due to essentially this inability to resolve all the fine recesses. And there were some other studies that were done where when contrast was given, uh, on the echo, you're able to see the recesses a little bit better, and the volumes with contrast get closer to the volumes that you get with CMR and CT. So let me uh, pause there uh, and kind of finish off with uh, the appropriate use criteria, which again talks about, you know, obviously every single patient is not going to get sent for CMR for assessment of LV function, but the groups of patients where it's considered highly appropriate is obviously in patients with congenital heart disease where you want to accurately assess serial changes in LV, but also in RV volumes and RV mass. Uh, in patients who are post-MI or have heart failure, um, especially if they have uh, suboptimal echo images. And then lastly, when you have a discordance uh, between other tests. So by echo, you have an EF of 50, but by your spec, the EF was 25 or 30. When there's a discordance between other tests, that's also a role uh, for referring, on, referring a patient on for CMR. So let me stop there, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chang, who's going to talk about the uh, assessment of uh, uh, volumes and mass and EF by uh, CT and uh, nuclear. Dr. Chang. Thank you. Well, as Steve mentioned earlier, echo is the go stand, I mean, the go-to technique for routine um, EF assessment. MRI will be in actually very close, I believe, nowadays in line. Uh, nuclear and CT um, offer a complementary role. I mean, so you basically, if you want to be a cardiologist, you need to know in a situation when you have questions or, or differences between uh, different techniques, Sometimes you have to uh, go to a third or fourth technique to help you uh, decide what what's the LV function of the patient is. Okay, so um, real quickly, um, there's several techniques to evaluate uh, LV, fun LV ejection fraction, I should say, using nuclear technique. There's only two that you need to know as a fellow, uh, because those, those, these two are, one of them are nowadays rarely used. Uh, the other one, is actually quite common. We don't order that as a, as, as a test to assess LV ejection fraction, but the information come with you uh, with the perfusion data. So, and it, it is completely different approach, okay? So first one is called blood pool imaging, okay? Uh, unlike MRI or echo where you're looking at, you're looking at the myocardium, right? And you're actually tracing the endocardial border and you come out with the volume uh, this is completely different approach. This is almost like the LV gram that you do in a cath lab, okay? So you, you label the, the blood with radioisotope. So you're imaging the blood, okay? You're not imaging the myocardium. So you label the uh, uh, red blood cells uh, with technician agent. And what we do now is called equilibrium radio, uh, radionuclide angiographic, angiocardiography or MAGA, okay? You can do either planar or tomographic. Again, these techniques we probably did less than 10 last year, um, but we still do it occasionally. And the uh, myocardial provision imaging is volume-based. It's, it's more similar to echo and MRI in terms of you're actually imaging the myocardium rather than the blood, okay? So this, this is what a MAGA look like, okay? It's a planar. Uh, essentially, you trace the region of interest is completely count-based, okay? So this is no, no ge ge a geometric assumption. You count this area of interest where you think the LV is in different type of cardiac cycle. Basically, it's very easy. EF is the count that you have in the end of minus count in the end of systole, divided by count over end of diastole. All right, instead of volume, you use count. 
all right? And actually, this technique, because the planar have very high frame rate, relatively 16 to 32. And so, mm -hmm. so the ejection fraction that you obtain is quite accurate. Uh, it's very accurate, actually. It's, um, I would say the first technique we used to assess LV ejection fraction even before uh, uh, 2D echoes and CT and MR, obviously. And the dosimetry is very acceptable, OK? And then, and then you can see here the curve. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so usually you get about 32 uh, point during the cardiac cycle. So, uh, and you can, you know, the, the again, in addition to uh, assess LV excision fraction, like the LV angiogram that you do in the cath lab, you can uh, reproduce different projection and then assess uh, roughly regional wall motion depending on the projection that you get. Okay. What's the advantage? There's, again, no geometric assumption. It's very well validated. It's very reproducible. And believe it or not, it allows you to assess the astolic function assessment. The disadvantage is, uh, is planar imaging uh, in RVEF cannot be assessed. And of course, like any other technique, you have to do it right. If you don't do it right, you're going to have mistakes and errors. And that's a problem, because it's nowadays we, it's done so infrequently. I mean. Uh, very hard to find a technician who know how to do it well. So before you go ahead and order a MAGA, make sure you go to, they know how to do it. Um, OK? And the next technique is perfusion-based gate spec myocardial perfusion imaging. It's a fancy term. This is the EF you get when you order a nuclear stress test. OK? So essentially, you give radioisotope, which is being captured, is being captured by the myocardium. And then you, you do very fancy 3D assessment and out, you know, using automated algorithm. Um, actually, this Thursday, you're going to hear a lecture about um, uh, use a perfusion, uh, nuclear technique for assessment of heart failure. Uh, Dr. Dr. Prem, he's, he's one of the leading experts in this area. He can, if you have any question about how this is derived, you'll be the person to ask. But regardless, so essentially, you can. Uh, you know, using fancy and, and, and very complicated automatic uh, algorithm, you can kind of define the shape and the border of the tissue, okay? And, and how we do it is, is gated a technique. is same thing with CT and MRI. Essentially, uh, is unlike echo, here we acquire the, the heart um, images for usually 8 to 10 minutes. And then you break it down into different part of the cardiac cycle, and you put all the images from the same part of the cardiac cycle in, into a one bin, and usually 8 to 16. A routine is 8 being done, and that's uh, obviously a, sh uh, a disadvantage because you know having a, a, a part in the cardiac cycle is very hard to, for you to hit the true end systolic and diastolic volume, and that have some repercussion in terms of the normal value that you obtain compared to other technique. Um, very important from the fellow. I mean, I wouldn't just you know, look at the uh, computer screen, uh, the EF they give you, because this is completely automated. You know, it, it, you could, it's some, uh, doing, doing the reconstruction and, proce and processing, you, you have some control. But once the tech <coughs> provides this to you, you, know, you really don't have to do anything else. So, but you need to do your quality control. Look at the sinogram, make sure it's nice and smooth, and make sure the curve doesn't have a significant spike. So this is a case of a patient with a lot of arrhythmia. Uh, you can see the stripe, a horizontal stripe across the sinogram, and, um, and uh, a very a large variation in the spikes in the, in the curve. So this usually speaks about uh, arrhythmia, and the EFU you get is probably not going to be very um, reliable, uh, essentially. A rule of thumb is you need at least 80% of the beat to be for the gated information to be available. So if you have a patient with PVC, uh, if it's more than one in six or seven PVC, every every five or six beat you have a PVC, those patients I would not definitely do a, a gated study. Okay, um, I'm not going to worry with the data, but essentially it, it has been shown to be very useful clinically. And uh, what, what's the caveat? Uh, the caveat is obviously nuclear has very low spatial resolution, uh, especially small heart. You have partial volume effect. 
uh, EF usually overestimated because uh, systolic volume when the heart contract, uh, systolic volume is underestimated. So the small heart, sometimes you know you can get EF of 90 percent, right? You see in the echo lab, in the nuclear lab. Um, RV assessment is not good. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, because the low frame per cycle, usually eight, the EF is underestimated. Okay, because you you all, you always underestimate the true end systolic and diastolic volume, but the difference is, is, is more important for end systolic volume. Therefore, when you get your EF, EF is going to be uh, lower. Uh, again, obviously, if your patient have extensive infarction, uh, sometimes the algorithm doesn't work, or you have very uh, hot, what we call hot, uh, uh, organ in the, in the abdomen or adjacent structure, uh, the, 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 the algorithm could consider the area of a high uptake as part of the heart, and you're going to get very distorted images uh, and obviously not reliable. Again, this is a typical example of a patient with a small heart. I mean, basically, there's no, no cavity, right? Uh, you know, occasionally we do see a patient with very hyperdynamic heart with LV uh, obliteration, but, uh, but this is most, more a problem, especially is, is exacerbated. Let's say this way with uh, myocardial perfusion imaging based technique. Uh, you can see this is very important for you guys when you go out there. Uh, almost all the software that one uses, uh, either QPQS, 40 uh, spec, you know, toolbox, uh, you can see the ejection fraction, the normal value for ejection fraction is 50%, which, you know, in nuclear or CT, or nuclear, in, for echo and MRI, that would be considered. Uh, if not low normal or mildly depressed, okay? So it's definitely, it's especially lower for men. I think basically for women because the heart is smaller, that's why you get you know, a little bit higher ejection fraction. But in general, it's, it could be up to 5 to 10 percent lower than uh, the EF that you get from MRI, okay? It's very important. Okay, and, and of course, you know, with different vendor, uh, you're going to have different because the algorithm you use is different, you're going to get a different normal value in it, okay? Okay, uh, just a real quick question, quick issue, because you need to know this, not because uh, we're going to order a nuclear stress test just to get an EF, because this EF come free, okay? You don't need to order. Every time you order a perfusion imaging, you get an EF, right? Same thing when you order a stress echo, right? You get an EF here. So this is completely free information, no additional images. Uh, so, but you need to know how to use it in addition to know the EF, the volume, which are all important predictor of outcome. But most important, you need to use this gate information to help you interpret the perfusion study. Okay? And it has been shown in this study that if you have perfusion image alone plus gated, when you interpret your perfusion study, you're more confident. Okay? So the black bar is when you don't have the gate information, you get a lot of borderline, normal, borderline, abnormal. So you're not as confident. But when you have, um, when you have the gate information, most of the study fall into either abnormal or normal. So it's more confident, okay? That's, and also has been shown to improve the uh, diagnostic accuracy compared to angiogram. That's why it's important, yeah. Typical example, we do that all the time, right? If you patient have fixed defect, right? Like this lady with anterior wall defect uh, right here, both stress and rest, and the wall motion is completely normal, EF is normal. Well, I mean, you know, scar, if it's a true scar, the wall motion should be abnormal, the EF should be lower. So this is very useful, and, and especially for men, you know, for diaphragmatic attenuation, uh, that really make a, a big difference. Okay, so cardiac CT, I'm not going to talk about EVCT because we don't have, we don't use that clinically anymore. Uh, Multi-detector CT, um, essentially, you get image similar to what you saw in MRI, although um, uh, here the main difference in terms of acquisition versus MRI that we don't go, uh, we, don't, we don't obtain the image from a pre-established imaging plane. Okay, here, basically, like, uh, it's a, a, a wide edge approach. It basically push the button, and the whole data set, true 3D data set is obtained. After that, you orient 
the heart the way you want, usually it's traditional echo view. So it's for you to al allow you to assess for a regional function, uh, like I show you here. Okay, the, top, the top row is the image that you scroll down and actually from top to the bottom, that's the image you get. And the second row here is when you reorient the heart into any plane you want. Okay? Here you don't have any problem with uh, missing the apex. Okay? You don't have a problem with going over the mitral or nanolow plane because everything is there. Okay? And it, since the, the slight thickness is so, so thin, 0 0.5 millimeter, I mean, there's no cardiac structure which is smaller than that. So essentially, there's no risk of missing any anatomical information. So, oh, so that's the main difference. Okay. okay. And you can see once you have an image, you can do the same thing with, you know, with MRI. You can just trace endocardial border uh, and then uh, using the same Simpson uh, method to, to true this and, and get your ejection fraction. Okay. So usually we divided, uh, again, it's also gated. Uh, we divided the cardiac cycle into usually 10 phases. When you get 20 phases, you have too many pictures. And remember, when you divide um, uh, the data set into 20 phases, you're not improving uh, the spatial, uh, the temporal resolution, okay? We can discuss some more in, during CT lecture. I think next will be given by Dr. Navi. But it, do, it does make things look uh, choppier, less choppier. So things, you know, smoother when you, when you, uh, when you look at it. For this, and this, this image is, is it generated by, I think, 50, cycle, 50 data sets for cardiac cycle. So thing looks nice and smooth, and, but, uh, but there's a lot of very intensive uh, a computer. Again, this is a gated imaging, it's the same. Uh, so traditionally, we cannot get the ejection fraction unless you do retrospective gating, meaning you have the tube on during the entire cardiac cycle. You can dial it down in a certain part of the cardiac cycle, but you need to image the whole cardiac cycle to decide when is the end systole and when is the end diastole. Okay? But now with the prospective gating, we, it's possible to obtain ejection fraction as well. You could it requires some technical manipulation of the scanner, but potentially you can image, for instance, from, um, uh, let's say, 40% uh, of cardiac cycle to 0%, 90% of cardiac cycle. Okay, so, you, so basically you do prosecutive gating, you have the tube turned off uh, during, uh, during systole, okay? So you have actually end of systole and end of diastole, okay? but you're imaging only diastole only. Or you can image only systole only. Does it make sense? So the tube is on doing systole or doing diastole. So you, you can still get the EF, but you don't get obviously all the regional wall motion information if you only image the diastole. Okay. So uh, overall, compared to other technique, um, CT underestimate usually compared to MRI or the reason being uh, because of the temporal resolution is not as good. Uh, just the ex explanation is a, is a follow, right? Systole is at least 300 milliseconds with a heart rate of 60 or 70 per, per minute. Uh, so in the minimum volume maintained, meaning the true end systole lasts about 80 to 200 milliseconds. Okay, that go to you know, if you have that temporal resolution, if the temporal resolution is 75 to 225 millisecond, it's very hard for us to catch exactly when, you know, freeze the heart long enough to image the true uh, end systole or the heart with the minimum volume. Uh, you know, from MRI literature, the thing about MRI is depending how long you ac acquire the images, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Faisal Deepen is, you can get very ex extremely good temporal resolution if you s spend enough time and have patient under the, the scanner for a long period of time. You can get, I don't know, could be you know, 20, 30 milliseconds, but so it's not routinely done. Right, 30 milliseconds is what we routinely do. We get it down to five milliseconds. Exactly. So basically, people have done the study showing that you know, which temporal resolution you need minimal to, to, for you to be able to 
catch the true and ancestry. And and uh, from MR literature is you know you need true, you need temporal resolution about f at least 45 milliseconds for you to, to do that. Okay, so so anyway, that's why CT underestimate. Same as spec because of temporal resolution. Computer MI we underestimate the excision fraction. Okay, um, all right. So, okay, there's two way we can do the calculate excision fraction. Number one, as I told you earlier, is 2D technique is similar to MRI. Okay, based on Simpson method, and th then you have what we call 3D techniques, or um, and how? Okay, so. This is not that important. The next. So this is the other we call 3D or threshold-based segmentation, and the reason CT is able to do this because the true 3D acquisition we have very good uh, contrast difference between the myocardium and the in the LV cavity, and because of the isotropic resolution, meaning in all three dimension, uh, the, the spatial resolution is the same. You can actually just follow the threshold of the contrast and allow you to calculate the, the, the excision fraction. As you can see, uh, basically, you can skip the major pop muscles and um, to give you an example, so on the right-hand side, the right-hand side would be traditional approach, 2D approach. You trace every single slice, all right? And you can see the problem, right? I mean, because you either include the pop muscle or you don't include, depending what, what you do. But if you have threshold-based technique, the left-hand side is completely generated by the computer. So you don't have, so you know, MRI fellow wish they have this because otherwise what would they do, huh? right? So each one has its own caveat, 2D approach, you know, obviously a lot of user interaction, time consuming. Obviously there's some semi-automated system to help you, right? Uh, introduce systematic error because either you include or to exclude the pop muscle can give you different uh, number, uh, and how against you know how how far you move your base or segment in the mitral annulus plane. I mean, it's not easy when you get to a mitral annulus plane to decide exactly you, are you in the atrium or in the ventricle. Okay, and obviously you need to have study with free of arrhythmia and uh, and step artifact like I shown here, uh, and 3D techniques. The advantage is very simple and uh, fully automated, but the problem is you need a very, you know, homogeneous opacification LV, and um, you, have, you have a difference more than 150 Huntsville unit between the myocardium and the LV cavity for you to, uh, um, to have a, a good result. But anyway, so in conclusion is, you know, you can, you can get, a, you can get a X e LVEF either with nuclear technique or CT technique. It's rarely the primary reason. I would say almost never. Um, and functional information that you obtain from the CT or nuclear help you actually with the reason why you order the CT or nuclear for the first place. Let's put it this way. So when you have nu order nuclear study, the gate information help you interpret the perfusion study. Same thing with CT. If you have a patient who have, for instance, LED, severe calcification, you're not sure, is true stenosis, and you look at the functional information, and the LV, you have an LV aneurysm with a clot in there. Well, you know that yeah, stenosis is significant. Does that make sense? So don't forget that. All right. So let me, I think I, I, I opened the, the program. I hope I can show you how this is done. Uh, Dr. Chen, quick question. Yeah. The post stress EF, how high is it compared to the resting EF? Well, the well I remember, remember, we don't, when we say post stress EF, we're not really post-stress, right? It's not peak, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so basically it's very specific, meaning if, if post-stress EF is lower than resting EF, you know the, the, the ischemia is very significant, right? Because if you persist even 10 minutes after you stop exercising and EF is low, you know it's real, right? But it's, it's not very sensitive, same reason, yeah? Um, Uh, more contrast after 
No, no, I just want to show you this example here. You can see uh, it's not very, not very bright. The contrast level noise is not optimal for coronary assessment because you really need at least 300, 350 Hounsfield unit. I think this one we only achieved 250, and the reason is we gave only 35 cc of contrast. Okay, going back to the question, uh, and we gave basically 25 cc of contrast bolus in the beginning to opacify the right, the left side. It will follow by 10 cc of contrast diluted with uh, 10 cc of uh, saline to opacify the right side. So technically, if you want to just LV function. I probably could do this study with 20 cc of contrast, okay, for instance. So, so, so basically, as you can see, you, know, you can reorient the heart the way you want, and basically the way you, once the study is loaded, um, okay, and then we go to analysis. Well, timing images, you know, we do bolus, we do um, bolus tracking, meaning that we just, you know, whenever you reach certain amount of uh, Huntsville units, the, 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 the scanner would, would uh, okay, so that didn't take too long. So, um, so you loaded all the faces, and you can orient the, you can just orient the heart the way you want. Let me try to see. Okay, so typically you can make it like, uh, I don't think I can. Okay. okay, so once it's loaded, you can just, you can, you can review it, okay, just like. So this is, um, you know, this is a patient with a heart rate of 90. So uh, it's really not. So you can assess the wall motion, RV motions, wall, um, and then it's loading. So basically, it's, what the what the software doing the in the background is doing this automatic segmentation that I told you about. Okay, essentially, it's following. A pre-established algorithm, uh, again, a lot of machine learning in terms of what structure is what. They think, you know, using standardized, using a lot of CT images, teach the software to recognize this is aortic uh, valve, this is mitral valve, because I didn't tell the machine where the mitral valve is, for instance, the software. So uh, basically, uh, you follow the coronary, generate a tree, and, um, and generate the RV and and LV and left atrium and right atrial volume. So, okay, so there we go, right? This is the result. It's not bad, actually, I'm, I'm impressed even with uh, Wi Fi, it took less. Okay, so this is, and for instance, if I want to just see the left ventricle, for example, okay, I just see, I want to see left ventricle, all right? So let me do this. And so this is a, like a left ventricular cast. Okay. So this is what, okay, so any, I don't know why it's flash. okay. So then you go to, well, function analysis is still going through all the phases. So essentially what it does is, okay, I think I can do this to illust illustrate what I, what I mean, okay. So for instance, I want to see uh, if I think n systole, oh, still haven't finished it. Okay, there we go. So 30% of the cardiac cycle, I think, is end systole. And, and I look at the images, and I think it did a decent job in tracking, right? So I can go to 
this is real quick. So LV, and then you go to, I'm doing this because they haven't, it's not finished yet. So you go to volume, give, give you an end systolic volume 186 cc. You see that in the, right here? Yes? Okay. And then you go to in diastole. Hopefully it's done already. Still not done. So the same. So this is, that's the principle. So, but you always always have option to go back and trace it and change if you don't think it's doing a good job. So, okay, that's, that's all I need to show you guys.